Happy Sabbath. I tell you what, um, when we prepare these moments together, you could think of um, what one might have to pay to go to a concert with good music and then pay to have uh, some political person talk to you. Um, you didn't have to pay this morning, you could give a free will offering. But thanks for coming, because I know that it's not because you want to pay, but because you want to receive the blessing that God has in store for you. And I hope that by us looking at Scripture today, that you get the word that you came for. If you don't, then I want to hear about it, first of all. And second of all, I would like to direct your attention to the homework that we are handing out in these weeks where we are dealing with the topic shaped, shaped by God, shaped by God. Many people uh, think of different exercises that can be done personally, but I am interested in us looking at what God does with our circumstances to shape us. I believe this is how he is working with us in order to make us into that which uh, we need to be not only now, but then uh, when he comes and we see him face to face, we are not going to be surprised. How's that? If you want to be surprised on the day of Jesus coming, then don't pay attention to coming to church or being in prayer or reading your Bibles. Don't, don't do that because then you can be all of a sudden surprised when the Son of Man comes in the clouds of glory. But if you want to know him even now and, and be part of his kingdom even now, then doing what you're doing, doing what I'm doing, is going to be very helpful and it will allow the Holy Spirit to work with you. So last week we talked about divine guidance. I've asked Nellie to come up. Uh, she, is, she is willing to, to say something that she learned in the book of First Samuel. So please turn in your Bibles to the book of First Samuel. Okay. The reason that we said this is because in the book of 1 Samuel, you will find a number of, uh, I'm going to ask for the, this microphone to be turned on, a uh, number of uh, examples of how God led in the, in, the, in the life of David. But I don't know. Nellie, what did you find in, in 1 Samuel that is an example of divine guidance? When you read 1 Samuel 1, right? Mm. Sure. Um, it's as you wish. <laughs> you find right, the story. Right yeah. You find the story of Hannah and how she was asking God to uh, give her one. a son. So she put her trust in God, and God gave her a son. And in return, she gave her son to to God back again for His service. And the way I see it, God knew that. God knew Hannah's heart, so he gave her the desire of her heart. And mainly is putting our trust in God, what makes these things happen. You know there's that text, she reminds me that there's that text that says um, uh, that he will give you the desires of your heart. I've often thought, how can God give me the desires of my heart when the other text says that the, the, the desires of my heart are often evil? How does that work? Well, here's, here's the answer. Here's the answer. When our hearts are in tune, in with, tune God, with God, yeah? and he, he knows our hearts. When our hearts are in tune with God, then when he gives us the desires of our heart, it's like giving us the desires of his heart, right? So that's, to me, that's how it makes sense that the Bible could say, I will give you, I think it's a Psalm 30-something uh, that... I will give you the desires of, our, of your heart. Example of divine guidance. Thank you. Mine, I've chosen, is uh, further along. It's a, a very interesting part of the book of Samuel. It's, of course, about David because most of the book of Samuel 
First and Second Samuel is about what happened during the life of Samuel, and this is the time when David is alive. This is chapter 27, chapter 27 of First Samuel. David decides to hide. He needs to hide because uh, Saul is chasing him. The king who knows that, Sa- that David is going to be the next king and that God has, ha- has left him, uh, he knows and so he chases after, Sam- uh, uh, after uh, David. David chooses to go and hide with the enemy. I, I don't, I, it, this is interesting that God would lead him to go and hide with the Philistines. So he goes to Achish, uh, the king of the Philistines, and actually, after living with him for a little while, with, with his 600 men, by the way, 600 men and their families. So let's just say that they were married and, and, and each one had kids. Now it's three times six. That's 1,800 people. Uh, that's a big group of people that are hiding out with the Philistines. So David asks and receives the use of one of the Philistine towns known as Ziklag. I love biblical names. They're so much fun. Uh, this, this one is particularly fun. Ziklag. He is given the use of a Philistine town, and he and his men and their families are garrisoned there. And the Bible says that Saul did not chase him. So what did uh, David do while he was waiting? (laughs) This is the funny, funny part uh, for the Philistines, actually, because this is how David pulls the wool over the Philistines. He goes out raiding in Philistine territory but tells the king that he's uh, raiding in the Negev, thinking to tell the king that he's actually uh, opposing opposing, uh, Saul. Interesting. God guides David to live with the Philistines. I don't know. Do you you receive guidance like that, divine guidance in your life? Have you... Have you been asked to do something really uh, crazy because there is somebody who is maybe chasing you at work or, or making your life miserable somehow, and God comes up with a crazy solution to your problems? But by following him, you maybe have found in your life that there is protection for you so that you can continue being the person that God wants you to be. This is evidence uh, from the Bible of divine guidance. The second piece that we're dealing with today, however, is the word peril. Now, am I right? I won't say ladies because that's sort of sexist, but when you go into the soap department at Walmart or somewhere, is there a soap called peril or is it Purcell? Maybe it's Purcell. Okay, I, I, that, that's just a glitch, sorry. <laughs> I thought that there might have been a soap called Peril. But th- that, that would be funny though, right? I mean, that there would be something that would be used to wash your clothes with that's called Peril, like your clothes are going to be in some sort of peril. Uh, but that is how it seems to be these days that God has caused us to live in a time when we could say, There is a lot of peril out there. There, These are, uh, to use the other part of the word, these are perilous times. If you don't believe me, follow me home. Soledad was jam-packed today. My wife came early because she wanted to pray with someone. Couldn't get here, had to pray on the telephone. Told me soon enough, sorry darling, I didn't tell you, I knew, I should have told you. Because on, on my first journey here and back this morning uh, to help with our family, Promise Families, I saw that there was a telephone pole, you know those ones that are about this big, that had been sheared off at the bottom. Somebody hit that telephone pole last night and sheared it off at the bottom. And they had set up cones, and they were preparing to take, take that telephone pole down while they put another telephone pole up. I don't know. Uh, maybe if, 
if you get one of those uh, websites that tells you about all the accidents that happen in Santa Clarita, you will understand the peril that someone was in last night when they hit that telephone pole with such force that they completely sheared it off at the bottom. That had to be 60 miles an hour or more, I would imagine. The peril that we find ourselves in can be uh, uh, talked about in Luke 21. So let's go to Luke 21. We, we don't have much time this morning, and so I want, to, want you to, to get what, what Scripture has for you this morning. It starts with a story about the widow's might. And some of you have had pastors who have actually uh, bought one of these tiny, tiny, tiny little coins when they went to Israel. It's very, very small, very small. And, 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 and so we, we, we talk about a widow's might. And, and the idea is that it was very small. The other idea that's right there in verse 4 is that it was evidence of the fact that she was poor. So you have a ratio here that Jesus points out to his disciples. In her poverty, this is verse 4, she put in all that she had to live on. So she has this much, and she puts it all in. There are people that are coming by, and they're also giving offerings, and believe me, this is not the pastor hitting on you for, for more money, believe me. Okay? If the Holy Spirit says you, know, you should do something with your money, just do it. Don't, don't rely on me to make you feel bad or good or whatever. You know, listen to the Holy Spirit about this. She was listening to the Holy Spirit. She took everything that she had to live on. Everything, let's, let's, let's put it in perspective. Everything that she was capable of using in the current economy, to live on. It takes money to live, right? And so she takes all her money, her two widow's mites that she probably had been given as a donation, she takes those widow's mites and she puts them in the offering plate. We could say she's all in. Jesus wants to make a comparison here, and this is the backdrop to what we need to hear today. Jesus makes a comparison that the others take from their vast wealth. The inference being that they have been, they, they, they have these big lives, and that these big lives have also been given to them by the same God who has provided for this widow. Who, by the way, just, just the fact that he's talking about a widow, I can't pass this up to tell you. Remember, widows were people who were disenfranchised. Nice big word to mean disconnected from the economy of their day. Remember the story of Ruth? If you remember that story, you know that that's the whole thing that Jesus is bringing into focus here. This is the disenfranchised, the disconnected. She's all in in the, in the economy of God. But others who feel that they can take care of themselves and have indeed done very well for themselves, they, they give out of a feeling of uh, maybe obligation, a feeling of wanting to be recognized for what they are doing, and, and, and they, they don't need to give just a little bit. They can afford to give a lot. But even when they give a lot... They're not all in. So, I don't know, maybe this is a new thought for you about this. It's really not about the sums of money that Jesus is making a comparison here. He is making a comparison about their attitude and about their connection to God who has provided for everyone. And you have someone who is saying... You've provided everything for me. I am going to give everything I have, like Hannah, in the story of Hannah and her son Samuel. I am going to take everything that I am and everything that I have and acknowledge that it belongs to you anyway. Here's, here's what I preached when I was a young preacher. It, it, you know, you, you don't remember every sermon that you ever preached, but I preached this one. It was called The Gospel According to the Jelly Bean Jar. I like Jelly Bellies. I've even been to the Jelly Belly factory. 
you know, one of those people who say, oh, I like Disney. I go every year five times. You know, that's your thing. Uh, I, I wanted to know how jelly bellies are made. And let me tell you, uh, you know, from, a, from a, a, a machine, I like machines. I like to know how things work. Jelly bellies, that's an amazing process that they use to make jelly. You'd think it would be just like, bloop, bloop, bloop. No, no, no. We've, we're talking big, huge tumblers that put layer upon layer upon layer on a jelly belly. What I like best is that there are jelly flops. Some of you know this because you know jelly beans and jelly flops. Jelly flops are the jelly beans that come out maybe a little misshapen, or when the stamping machine comes along and puts jelly belly name on each and every jelly belly, if they put a little skew, or maybe it says jelly and not belly, then those all get taken out and, and, and get put into a special big bag in the store, and you, they're, they're much cheaper, of course, and they get called jelly flops instead of jelly bellies. But I, I preached this sermon called The Gospel According to the Jelly Bean Jar, and it's a simple, simple idea that I want you to remember. If you leave the jelly beans in the jar, they're going to get stale. You ever eaten a stale jelly bean? I must admit, I've had a stale jelly bean or two in my life. They're kind of not right. They're a little more gooey and sticky. The hard outside has begun to disintegrate. And that's what happens if you leave the jelly beans in the jar. They get to stick together. They're not fresh. So what's the antidote? The antidote is use them. Share them. The Gipper, otherwise known as Ronald Reagan, he liked jelly beans too, didn't he? He always had a huge big jar of jelly beans on the big table where he had his cabinet meetings. I wonder how many times he, you know, people would come in and just stick their hand in there and take a huge big you know, handful of jelly bellies uh, to, to eat uh, jelly beans. That, that's, a, that's a great, great thing. But it, it talks about the fact that if you are low on jelly beans, do you get worried? No, because the jelly bean king has said, I will put more jelly beans in your jar. If you, if, you, if you don't hear anything else this morning, please hear that God will take care of you in the midst of peril. And even when you feel like your jelly bean jar is empty, if you like the widow's might, or the widow, give everything. Do say, God, I am all in. I am all in. He will never let your jelly bean jar go empty. He'll just keep filling it up. He'll just keep filling it up. We move right along into another piece here, but I, I'm going to show you that the, 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 having this attitude of being all in is so important when we think about what Jesus says next. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. Jesus said, as for what you see here, so he's talking about the, their beautiful temple, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. And, and, and for your, your, your deeper perusal, I want you to remember that Paul paints the picture of us being a, a, a temple of living stones. So if Jesus is, not, Jesus is not only talking about the temple physically, he's also talking about the group of people that were thinking that they were the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in fact were destined to be taken apart and thrown down because they no longer were giving worship to God. These, by the way, are words that later on he gets accused by false witnesses or for witnesses on the trumped-up charges while he's before Herod. Remember, oh, he said that you know, the temple would be destroyed. This was blasphemy in the day. Because the temple stood for the, the whole religious cultus of his day. And so Jesus is saying, this whole religious idea that you have is going to be torn down and not one stone will be left on the other. How can this be? They're thinking it's, it's impossible. These are such big stones. Which is why 
you have the picture that you do on the front of your bulletin. If you want to take a quick look at that, thank you, Amy Hinkle, my secretary. She chooses great pictures. The picture is of the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. by Titus. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? I want you to know that there is a rising tide within Adventism today that is asking these self-same questions. Why is that? Because these self-same situations are existing, not only inside the church, but also in society today. And so there are many of us, myself included, who are asking Jesus, Jesus, are the things that I see happening in my world today, are the things that I see happening in my church today, are these the signs that you were talking about when you said this in Luke 21? Jesus replies, verse 8, Watch out that you are not deceived, my friends. I cannot agree more with Jesus Christ when he says these words. Because you see, the, the deceptions, my friends, are not only going to come from outside. There are also going to be individuals, look what he says, for many will come in my name claiming I am he. Or let's say it slightly differently, I know him and this is who he is. Or they will say, the time is near. Time of what? Please ask, please, please ask questions. Please don't take my word for it. Please do your own study. The time is near. Do not follow them. He said, when you hear of wars, shootings, how many were there this week? At least two that I know of in different parts of this wonderful country of ours. Second Amendment gives us the right to bear arms. It also gives us the right, in many respects, to go crazy with them. How do we work that out? I'm, I'm not sure. When you hear of wars and revolutions, how many people left Venezuela this week? They are pouring out of Venezuela into Brazil. Walking. Just like we saw people walking after coming out of Syria and walking into Germany. Now we're seeing people in Venezuela walking out of Venezuela and into Brazil. Okay, this, is, this is not Paul's era. This is this last week. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come. Will not come. Adventist, are you hearing me today? The end will not come right away. Yeah, the Adventist church has been around over 150 years. I was always so tickled by the way in which 150 passed. There was only one or two media people who kind of poked, poked at Adventists, and we kind of we kind of cowered a little bit. Because we've been saying all of my life, all of my father's life, all of my grandfather's life, we have been preaching that Jesus is coming soon. 150 years, that doesn't sound like soon. You, you get a feeling that we know a little bit about how Noah felt when he preached for 120 years. We've preached now over 150 years. Maybe we should listen to this text that says, when you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. When, when perilous times come, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then, they say, then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes. Oh, that wasn't the great one we had the other day, was it? I was away and my wife texts me and says, Oh, we just had an earthquake, 4.4. And everybody's going, yeah, so what? It's not the big one. It's not the big one. There'll be great earthquakes, famine, and pestilence in various places, and fearful events, and great signs in the heavens. Now, uh, 
I'm not saying that these have not happened. I'm saying they are happening. These are perilous. These are the times in which Jesus is saying, but before all this, uh, they will lay hands on you, they'll persecute you. We read all of the things that are going to happen to Jesus' disciples that have happened to faithful Christians down through the ages. Ah, can't, can't go by without saying this. If you're keeping up with any sort of news about other Christianity, actually let's talk about the main part of Christianity. It's in free fall right now in the United States. And if you know what I'm talking about, you're, I'm, I, yes, I'm, I'm talking about the Roman Catholic Church. I'm going to ask you to pray for them. Because there are millions of faithful Catholics in this country right now who are in free fall. Because the law is coming after their clergy. Five states already have declared and more states are declaring every day. Okay, People have been hurt and those that did the hurting should come to justice. But at the same time, it is going to cause a huge, a huge storm within the major part of Christianity on the planet. Because not only is this happening in the United States, but it's happening in many countries around the world. Lest we sit and gloat, my friends. Understand, understand that that these investigations also involve other denominations. Other denominations that by comparison to the Roman Catholic Church are little tiny ants. We talk about having 20 million members. There are 1.2 billion, billion with a B, Catholics. Okay? That is the church. That is Christianity in the world. We are this tiny, tiny little, little dissentering group. So I want you to know that, that many God-fearing people now are going to be saying, Oh, God, help us. So if you have friends, I want you to know that it's time to pray for them that they will seek God and that they will ask God for help and that He will answer their prayers and that they will come to a better relationship with Him. Now is the time to be doing that. It's, it's, it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. We're talking about Pennsylvania alone that came out earlier last month. Over 600 people 600 people coming forward. These are people whose lives are in shambles. These are people whose lives have been affected in very negative ways. And, and it's causing other people to question their relationship with God. These are perilous times. Not just for, for us. Not just for the Adventist church. But for, the, for those who call upon God and believe that Jesus Christ is His one and only Son, and is the way of salvation. Those individuals are under attack today because of how they may have been misled, because of how they may have been injured. That's not the story of, of Samuel from yesteryear, my friends. That's in the New York Times yesterday. So let's go with verse 30, 34 of chapter 21. Jesus is still talking. Hear his words today, my friends. Be careful. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. This is, these are some big words. Are, are you ready for these big words? Dissipation. Okay, lots of synonyms there. Dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxiety of life. And you may say, oh, I don't drink. You don't have to. Basically, what these could be, kept, could be put under is one, one big heading. Distractions. Because you see, this is, this is the, the main goal, the main goal of the evil empire and the evil one himself. He would like nothing less. He wants nothing less than simply to distract you from watching Jesus. 
First angel's message, what does it say? Angel flying in the midst of heaven. Fear God. Pay attention. This is the message of the first angel. Pay attention to God. Change your focus from the peril to the person. Because this is the age in which we live. We live in perilous times. Don't care how you slice it. Right here in Santa Clarita, you can have people driving so fast, drunken with whatever, drugged with whatever, that they hit a telephone pole and shear it off at the bottom. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down. Jesus is saying, don't let your, this is another way of John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let your hearts be weighed down. with dissipation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of this life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. How many of you could stand up right now? I bet you every single one of us could stand up right now and say, you know what, I have a friend. And my friend, if it's you this morning that has come here and, and you could stand up and say, you know what, I, I am in the midst of chaos. I don't know what the future holds. But maybe you have a friend who is in the same thing and you're watching this person who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, who is not hearing them, and, and you're, you're, you're watching how their life is going. And it, it, it is. It's like watching a, a train wreck in slow motion. And you're saying, but, 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 but. And then they get divorced. And dad leaves and their source of income dries up. A few months later, they get kicked out of their apartment. Now they're living in their car. Mom, two kids. Thank God that maybe they qualify to be part of family promise. That's who's been living with us this week. That's who's going to be living with us this next week. Do you know who took care of them this week in our facility? Our friends, the Latter-day Saints. The Wiley Canyon Ward partnered with us this week. They are anxious to be of assistance. They say thank you, by the way. Thank you for letting us use your church to house your people who through life's chaos and perils have found themselves unable to keep a roof over their heads. For these tiny children, many of whom are in our kindergartens and our schools right here in Santa Clarita, yeah, they went to school this week. From our church, the van picked them up and took the kids to school in Canyon Country. But they slept at our church. You, you helped provide that. I think you can take some sort of satisfaction in knowing that because your congregation provides this kind of thing, there are families that had a roof over their head last night in these perilous times. For it will come upon those who live on the face of the whole earth, talking about the whole economy, verse 36, be always on watch. This is now the prescription that Jesus gives, my friends. This is, the, this is the prescription for living in perilous times. This is how God is going to use these perilous times to shape us. They won't do any good for him if we are not doing what he says next, which is to watch and pray. Just like the first angels, uh, pay attention. That's what I mean by the word fear. That's what I believe John meant by the word fear. That's what I think the angel meant by the word fear. Pay attention to the God of creation. Thank you very much for coming to church today, my friends. You came on the seventh day, and by coming on the seventh day, you are showing your allegiance to the Creator God. It's that simple. Those that want to say different, please show me from the Bible. The same God, the same God says to us through Jesus Christ and his ministry to his disciples, which we all are today, watch and pray that you may be able to escape 
all that is about to happen. Okay? It may not, may not have happened exactly like we thought it would. Believe me, I didn't think that I would get to this point in my life and be living in these United States and have happening what is happening in these United States. However, I do know that God knew and that He has given us a way of escape. He's given us a way of escape. He says, uh, all that has happened and that is about to happen, that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. That's where we all want to be. We want to be able to stand. Because you see, the opposite of that is that you're running away. The picture at the end is Jesus is coming and there are those who stand and meet him in the air. What are the rest of them doing? They are asking the rocks to fall on them and hide them from the brightness of his coming because they are not prepared. They have not been given a glorified body and they will perish in the brightness of his coming. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. God shapes us with various things. The first thing that we learned this month was that He shapes us with His direct divine guidance. The words that Eli spoke to Hannah that day while she is at the temple, in a year from now, you will have a son. God gave him those words. The words that, 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 that came to David so many times as he was leading the people of Israel, God gave him those words. God led him and guided him. When David prayed to God, God answered him. And my friends, I'm just saying that with David, with, with Eli, you too, you, you too can have the life that God wants you to have in the midst of these perilous times. And you can be shaped. You can be shaped into what you need to be so that he can use you so that you can partner with him at this time. God bless each and every one of you. We do. We live in perilous times, but God is in control. Amen.